Income Tax 2023-2024, reporting rental income expenses and losses, limits on rental losses. Get ready and some coffee, because although the best things in life are free, you know eventually the government will find some way to tax them. Most of this information can be found in Publication 520. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. 27 residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Noting the Schedule E rental income flows into line one income of the individual income tax formula. The first half of the individual income tax formula basically being a funny income statement, having income minus instead of expenses, deductions, resulting in instead of net income, taxable income, the rental income on the Schedule E, similar to business income on a Schedule C, has an income statement format in and of itself, basically having rental income minus rental expenses, which you could call rental deductions, resulting in, in essence, net rental income, which is what flows in from the Schedule E to line one income of the individual income tax formula. This formula outlining the calculation on the Form 1040, of which we see the first page, the income section here, Schedule E ultimately rolling into line eight, additional income from Schedule 1. Then we have the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income, part number one, additional income, Schedule E rolling into line five, rental real estate from the Schedule E. This is the Schedule E, supplemental income and loss, which basically has an income statement type of format, broken out on per property basis. So we're continuing on now thinking about that income statement format of the rental property income minus expenses focusing in on the losses situation, noting and remembering that the IRS doesn't like losses, right? The IRS is thinking of themselves as your silent partner, but only when you make money. When you make money, they want their share. They want their bit as their your good silent partner. But if you lose money, then the IRS doesn't want to pay you for the losses that we're going to incur. They're like, get out of here, loser. We're not going to pay you. Right? They would rather not pay for the losses. So they're going to be skeptical of the losses because obviously they're not going to generally pay you if you have losses. But then the question is, can I take the losses against other income like the W-2 income, for example? And again, the IRS is going to be somewhat skeptical of that. You might have more limitations on the losses related to a rental property than you would for a Schedule C uh, type of business, in part because of the more passive nature of the rental property, or at least that is the argument. Also remember that if you deal with people that have rental property, it's quite likely that they might have losses because they might be holding the rental property for different reasons. If you have one house and then you wanna buy another home, instead of having it your second home, you might call it, you might have it as rental property, but it's serving possibly multiple purposes. One purpose might just simply be as a hedge against, say, inflation, uh, for example. So you're holding onto it, hoping it will retain value, even if the currency goes down and so on and so forth. Also, you're hoping it goes up just in value because of the location and scarcity of land itself, independent of the improvements that you might be putting into the property. And then on top of that, you have the rental nature of it where you might be renting it out, putting in different levels or varying levels of 
participation work or service into the property in order to generate that rental income. Therefore, it's quite likely that you'd be okay with losses in essence, especially if you can take them against other income when you also are considering the passive nature and hopefully the capital gain nature of the property possibly going up or at least acting as a hedge uh, against inflation or something like that. Okay, keeping that in mind, limits on rental losses. If you have a loss from your rental real estate activity, two sets of rules may limit the amount of loss you can report on Schedule E. You must consider these rules in order shown below. Both are discussed in this section. So you got the at-risk rules. So these rules are applied first if there are investment in your rental real estate activity for which you aren't at risk. So obviously the idea of the rental properties, typically you're at risk of like losses and whatnot or what goes on with the rental property in particular with regards to the financing of the rental property because usually if you financed the rental property you took out a loan in order to purchase the rental property then if you default on the loan then you're you're going to be at risk and possibly the rental property is on as collateral but you can imagine a situation where there's where you're not at risk if there's a default on the loan or something like that and if that was the case, the IRS is going to be more likely to want to limit the losses because you look like a more, much more kind of passive uh, investor in that case. Now, that might not be as applicable to most normal situations when you most likely are at risk in a normal type of situation because you're the one the bank's going to go after, for example, if they're was an issue with the loan so this applies only if the real property was placed in service after 1986 then we have the passive activity limits these are the ones that everybody kind of has to think about and this is the one where we have that interplay between the irs trying to say hey look all rental income is basically passive because you're just basically collected rents on property and you're not really doing anything plus you might have capital gains going up on the property and whatnot and you're not putting any labor in as you would in a service business typically reported on the schedule c but the people that rent the property oftentimes are going to say hey look i do put a substantial amount of work in i have i have to service this place i got to go fix the plumbing possibly you're actively investing i at least have to manage the property collect the rent keep on the the tenants to make sure that they pay me and basically if they're going in and out of the place and so on and so forth so then the IRS might give some leeway and say, well, we're going to call it passive, but you'll give you losses up to a certain degree or so, so on and so forth. Now, what happens if they call something passive? Then they're going to say, we're not going to basically allow the losses. What happens if you have income and it's passive income? Well, then the IRS is still your silent partner and they want a piece of it, right? But if you have passive losses, the IRS is going to say, we're not going to let you take passive losses uh, and because and we're not going to let you take it possibly against other income like W-2 income. However, you might be able to take it against passive income, possibly being able to roll it forward into the future. And if the rental property had income in the future, possibly netting the passive losses and passive income out. However, noting that a lot of times if people are holding on to rental property, they might have losses, you know, for multiple years because again, the rental income might not be the primary or the only reason they're holding on to the property and the calculation of being able to take advantage of possibly some form of losses might have been included in the in the calculation of wanting it as rental property in conjunction with the other things like like the capital gains hopefully the value of the property going up and being a hedge against inflation for example all right generally rental real estate activities are considered passive activities and losses aren't deductible unless you have income from other passive activities to offset them so you can think of passive activities having their own lane their own spot you can only group together losses against the passive income you can't go out of your lane to w-2 income schedule c income that's the general rule however there are exceptions so excess business loss limitation. So in addition to at-risk rules and passive activity lim limits, excess business loss rules apply to losses from all non-corporate trade or businesses. So now we have another kind of loss limitation, which is another kind of general loss limitation for you know larger losses. 
So this business loss limit is figured using form 461 after you complete your Schedule E. So any limitation to your loss resulting from these rules will not be reflected on your Schedule E. Instead, it will be added to your income on form 1040-1040-SR. So in other words, you have this big loss on the Schedule E, it's gone too far, they're not gonna allow some of the losses. What's that gonna look like logistically? Are you going to rework the Schedule E or something like that? No, they're, they're basically going to say we're going to add it back in by possibly to income somewhere else. So you've got the Schedule E calculation and then the income somewhere else. And then you, of course, have the question whenever they don't allow a loss, do I get to potentially take the loss going forward, which is usually the case. If it's a legitimate loss and you didn't let me take it this year, for whatever reason, you limited the income or passive or, or at risk, are you gonna let me possibly take it into the future if it complies with whatever rules are in the future, such as not having excess loss limitations in the future or having passive income to map out or match out to the passive income and so on and so forth, which is usually the case, right? Because it wouldn't be really fair if they just said, we're just gonna wipe out the losses and you have no chance to get any, any benefit from them, usually if they're legitimate losses. All right, instead it will be added to your income on form 1040 or 1040 SR and treated as net operating loss that must be carried forward and deducted in a subsequent year. All right, at risk rules. You may be subject to the at risk rules if you uh, have a loss from an activity carried on as a trade or business or for the production of income and amounts invested in the activity for which you aren't fully at risk. So that's the point of the business. When you're investing in the activity, you're at risk of the losses uh, that might accru accrue from the activity. If you're not at risk for the losses, something there's a different structure going on here that seems like something's a little bit funny uh, that, that is happening there. And, and if you're not at risk, then they're gonna say, we're gonna limit the losses. So losses from holding real property other than mineral property placed in service before 1987 aren't subject to the at-risk rules. So in most cases, any loss from an activity subject to the at-risk rules is allowed only to the extent of the total amount you have at risk in the activity at the end of the year. You are considered at risk in an activity to the extent of cash and the adjusted basis of other property you contributed to the activity and certain amounts borrowed for use in the activity. So you're the one basically putting up the cash and whatnot to get the activity going. Obviously, if you're talking about rental property, then if you bought the rental property, you're the one that's basically paid for the rental property. If you were the one that paid for the rental property, then you're, in, you're invested in the property. Clearly, usually with rental property, we have this big loan situation because oftentimes you need to get a loan financing in order to purchase the rental property. And usually you're on the hook for the financing, meaning if you don't pay the loan, the bank comes after you and possibly has the property as collateral. If the bank doesn't come after you for whatever reason, then that seems like a somewhat of an unusual situation that's been set up. So any loss that is disallowed because of the at-risk limits is treated as a deduction from the same activity in the next tax year. So see publication 925 for a discussion on the at-risk rules. So form 6198, if you are subject to the at-risk rules, file form 6198 with your tax return. All right, passive activity limits. Here we go with the passive activities. And most, what do you mean it's passive? I have to deal with these, I have to deal with these tenants all the time, calling me come to unplug their toilet or whatever, deal with their sink is clogged up. You call that passive? I should get to deduct my losses. That's the argument from the from the landlord uh, side, side of things on so, in some cases, right? But maybe if you just hire a management company to do that, then right, then there's some arguments that it's gonna be passive or less passive and can we find some middle ground, some middle territory. So in most cases, all rental real estate activities except those of certain real estate professionals discussed later are passive activities. For those purpose, uh, a rental activity is an activity from which you receive income mainly for the use of tangible property rather than for services. 
So in other words, when you think about rental property, the, the common thought is, well, you're just collecting rents on it. You're not doing anything. You just own the property. You're like, you're like the lord of the manor and people just pay you, pay you the, the, the whatever for just doing nothing. So, but again, the argu- and then the more kind of activities you do, if you're the one that actually does manage the property and deal with the problems and so on and go unclog the sink or at least hire the person that has to go unclog the sink or something like that, then it seems like you're taking on more active roles. So for a discussion of activities that aren't considered rental activities, see rental activities in publication 925. So deductions or losses from passive activities are limited. You generally can't offset income other than passive income with losses from passive activities. So that's the general rule. We might, we're going to have an exception to it, but the general rule is if it's declared passive, then that income's in its own lane. You can't net out the losses against other income. If you have income, the passive income's no problem to the IRS. The IRS is just going to take some of it, right? That's how things work. If you make money, they just take some of it. But if you have losses, the IRS is like, no, no, wait, hold up here. The losses are in their own lane. You cannot take those losses against other income. So nor can you offset taxes on income other than passive income with credits resulting from passive activities. So any excess loss or credit is carried forward to the next year. So it's like, well, you're not going to let me take my losses against W-2 income. Can I at least get some benefit from it? Well, if you have passive income in the following year, then we'll let you take the losses you had this year against the following year income. But you have to stay in your own lane. The passive stuff has to stay in its own lane. Look at the dub. There's double yellow lines in the road and you have to stay on your side of those. So exceptions to the rules for figuring passive activity limits for personal use of a dwelling unit and for rental real estate with active participation. So here's going to be one of the exceptions. Active participation are discussed later. So there's going to be an exception. For a detailed discussion of these rules, see publication 925, real estate professional. So you can then imagine people saying, hey, look, I'm a real estate professional. I do services all the time related to real estate. I'm not just sitting around and collecting rents on it. I'm on the phone all the time talking to these crazy people about this, that, and the other thing. It's my hair. Look at me. I don't even have any hair left. It's so stressful. So I should be able to not make it passive and get to deduct my losses. That's the argument from the real estate professionals. So if you are a real estate professional, complete line 43 of a schedule E, you qualify as a real estate professional for the tax year if you meet both the following requirements. More than half of the personal services you perform in all trades or businesses during the tax year are performed in real property trades or businesses uh, in which you materially participate. So we have some key terms, materially participate and so on, uh, which obviously you can try to get technical in terms of what is what does that actually mean? What do I have to do to qualify as materially participate and so on? So you perform more than 750 hours of services during the tax year in real property trades or businesses in which you materially participate. So if you qualify as a real estate professional, rental real estate activities in which you materially participate aren't passive activities. Ooh, they're not passive activities. They don't need to stay in their own lane anymore, which means if I have income, maybe not much has changed here, but if I have losses, possibly then I can take the losses against other kinds of income since I've removed the double yellow lines maybe. So for purposes of determining whether you materially participated in your rental real estate activities, uh, each interest uh, in rental real estate is a separate activity unless you elect to treat all your interest in uh, rental real estate as one activity. So you have this kind of technicality of do I qualify per property or do I want to treat them all as one to see if I qualify for all of them together. So don't count personal services you perform as an employee in real property trade or business unless you are a 5% owner of your employer. You are a 5% owner if you own or are considered to own more than 5% of your employer's outstanding stock or capital or profit interest. 
Don't count your spouse's personal services to determine whether you met the requirements listed earlier to qualify as a real estate professional. It's like, I, yeah, I worked on it. I didn't just sit around all day. I had to tell my spouse to get out there and go fix the sink for crying out. <laughs> that doesn't count, apparently. Can't do that. Uh, however, you can count your spouse's participation in an activity to determine if you materially participate. So you have that going for you. All right. Real property trades or business. A real property trade or business is a trade or business that uh, does any of the following with real property. So, so we have a bit of a different circumstance. You're imagining our standard scenario is I have a home and then I have a second home, which I'm renting out as real estate property. But of course, there's many different areas that you can be in in real estate that are going to have their own kind of kinks and things to deal with. Noting that if you're a tax preparer, you might specialize in some of these areas because they're going to have their own needs, such, such as uh, develops or redevelops. So if you're dealing with a developer or redeveloper, then obviously they're developing the area. You know, they're creating it. There's a whole different set of accounting and tax kind of consequences uh, related to that. Uh, con uh, constructs or recon they construct or reconstruct it acquires it, uh, converts it, rents or leases it, operates or manages it, and brokers it. So notice you can see all of these activities. It's more than typically you're thinking of them as more than simply, I'm just collecting the rent, right? Which would be like a passive activity. So this is real property trade or business situation. So choice to treat all interest as one activity. So if you were a real estate professional and had no more than one rental real estate interest during the year, you can choose to treat all the interest as one activity. You can make this choice uh, for any year that you qualify as a real estate professional. If you forego making the choice for, for one year, you can still make it for a later year. So note when we're thinking about the real estate situation, typically we have the schedule E with these different income statements per property. So in some cases, it, it might be more reasonable to, to treat everything as one, uh, one activity. And then for, with regards to the rules and possibly for like the accounting of it. So, so you want to make sure that once if you were to make that election, then usually you want to be consistent with it. So you want to make sure that you've kind of analyzed what would be the, the best choice in a particular situation. But a uh, choice to treat all interest as one activity. So if you make the choice, it is binding for the tax year you make it and for any later year that you are a real estate professional. So this is for the real estate professional and you wanna make sure again, that it's something that you want to do. You've considered the ins, the outs and so on, the ups, the downs and the pros, the cons because the, because the IRS is gonna want consistency once you make the election. So this is true even if you aren't a real estate professional in any uh, intervening year. For that year, the exception for real estate professionals won't apply in determining whether your activity is subject to the passive activity rules. So see the instructions for Schedule E for information about making this choice. Material participation. Here we go with that key term. We needed to part materially participate. What does that mean? Generally, you materially participated in an activity for the tax year if you were involved in its operations on a regular, continuous, and substantial basis during the year. So now we have a bunch of other key terms. On a regular, continuous, and substantial basis during the year. For details, you can see publication 926 or the instructions for the Schedule C. Participating spouse. So we have this situation, you get married, you have the spouse, usually you think of yourself as one entity now, but still you've got these weird nuances with taxes with regards to businesses and rental property as to do you treat yourself as one entity or like two entities, for example. So if you are married, determine whether you materially participated in an activity by also counting any participation in the activity by your spouse during the year. Do this even if your spouse owns an interest in the activity or files a separate return for the year. Form 8582. 
So you may have to complete Form 8582 to figure the amount of any passive activity loss for the current year uh, for all activities and the amount of passive activity loss allowed on your tax return. See Form 8582, not required later in this chapter to determine if you must complete Form 8582. If you are required to complete Form 8582 and are also subject to the at-risk rules, include the amount from Form 6198, Line 21, Deductible Loss in Column B of Form 8582, Worksheet 1 or 2 as required. All right. Obviously, tax software helps us out with those worksheets and whatnot, but we want to get an idea of the general idea, the general rules that are happening so we can double-check the worksheets and the software and be able to explain what's going on as well as project into the future what we should do. Exceptions for personal use of a dwelling unit. So if you use the rental property as a home during the year, any income deduction gain or loss allocable uh, to such use is not to be taken into account for purposes of passive activity loss limitation. Instead, follow the rules explained in Chapter 5, exception for rental real estate with active participation. So here's a big one. So we have, if you or your spouse activity part actively participated in a passive rental real estate activity, you may be able to deduct up to 25000 of loss from the activity from your non-passive income. All right, so here we go. So now we've got the second property, right? We're going to say, I have my second property, my second home. I'm renting it out. So the question is, well, are you, a, you if I have losses, am I a real estate professional? Well, possibly not. I, maybe I don't qualify to be a real estate professional, but I do do some uh, active participation managing the property and so on, at least, you know, collecting the rent and having to deal with them people going in and out and that kind of stuff. So then the IRS is like, well, it's passive, but maybe we'll allow you to deduct, deduct 25000 which is significant, possibly being subject, however, to income limitations. So if you have a higher income, then maybe that would be limited. So now we have that kind of middle spot right here. So this special allowance is an exception to the general rule disallowing losses in excess of income from passive activities. So similarly, you may be able to offset credits from the activity against the tax on up to 25,000 of non-passive income. So now we've got losses up to 25,000. I might be able to take against the W-2 income, other Schedule C income after taking into account any losses after uh, allowed under this exception. All right, example. Let's see how this works. How does this play out in real practical examples? So you are a single and have 40,000 in wages. So 2,000 of passive income from a limited partnership and 3,500 passive income from rental real estate activity in which you actively participated. 2,000 of your 3,500 loss offset your passive income. The remaining 1,500 loss can be deducted from your 40,000 wages. So let's do that again. We have the 40,000 wages, 2,000 of passive income, from a limited partner. So we have 2,000 coming from one source, but it is passive. Uh, and then we had 3,500 of passive loss from the rental real estate. So because it's a passive loss, we're still thinking of it as in its own lane before we consider whether we can deduct up to the 25,000. If it's in its own lane, we can still net this out against this because although they're not the same activity, they're both in the same lane of passiveness once we net that, that out, we get to the 1,500, which if we actively participated, we can clearly take because that's under the threshold of the 25,000. We're not hitting any income limitations because we only made the 40,000. So caution, the special allowance isn't available if you were married, lived with your spouse at any time during the year and filed a separate return. So remember, if you're married, you have the choice of filing married, filing joint, married, filing separate, married, filing joint is usually better. If you file married, filing separate, the IRS is going to be skeptical about many types of calculations, possibly because they're skeptical. You're going to take advantage of income limitations and phase outs filing separate so that you have lower income levels 
poss- that would allow deductions that wouldn't be allowed if there was a phase out. So active participation, you, what does that even mean? What does that even mean then? You actively participated in a rental real estate activity if you and your spouse owned at least 10% of the rental property and you made management decisions. I made management decisions. I said, hey, go over there and do something on the property, dang it. So anyways, you're managing the thing. Possibly you're, you're saying, you know, what needs to ha- happen? You're dealing with the calls that are coming in from the tenant, possibly sending out the, the plumber and so on and so forth. And you manage the decisions or arrange for others to provide services such as repairs in a significant and bona fide sense. So management decisions that may count as active participation include approving new tenants, deciding on rental terms, approving expenditures and other similar decisions. Now you might say, well, of course you would do that, but you might not because you might say, what if I hire a management firm that basically does all of that? Now you're questionable and saying, okay, well now you're not really doing anything, are you? You just hire, now you're just paying a management firm that's doing all that. But if you're the one that's actually going over there and unclogging the toilet, well then you're certainly actively participating. However, even if you're not the one unclogging the toilet, if you're if you're taking the call and then telling someone else that they got to unclog the toilet, or they're, you're following up on the accounting and you're making sure that they pay you, and when they don't pay you. You, you have to deal with the whole thing where they're squatting in your house and you're like, dude, get out. And you're like, no, I get to, I'm in California. I can squat here for like 10 years before you can kick me out. And you're like, ah, oh, dude, that's going to see if you have to deal with that, you're certainly still, you would think actively participating possibly should be allowed to take the losses, especially with those squatters in there, in this kind of annoying. Anyways, example. So you are single and have the following income and losses uh, during the year. So you had salary, 42,300, dividends, uh, interest, rental loss, 4,000. So the rental loss was from the rental of a house you owned. You had advertised and rented the house to the current tented yourself. You also collected the rents, which usually come by mail. You made a contracted out all repair. You made or contracted the repair. So you didn't hire a management company to do the whole thing. You're the one that's doing some of this management stuff, contacting the the contractors and that kind of stuff. Although the rental loss is from the passive activity because you actively participated in the rental property management, you can use the entire 4,000 loss to offset your other income. I don't know if it's worth it. Those those tenants are driving me crazy. I, I, I'm just going to hire a management company and, and then whatever. I'm not, I don't even want to deal with it. Right. That's what you, that's what a sane person would do normally. But if you are doing, if you are dealing with the management stuff, then you would think that you should get the laws. Maximum special allowance. So the maximum special allowance is 25,000 for single individuals and married individuals filing a joint return for the tax year. A little bit unusual here because you'd think it would be 50,000 for married individuals. So this is one of those kind of weird, usually like getting, when you're married, it's a benefit for taxpayers on the upper income side of things and often a disincentive on the lower income side of things because of the way the credits on the, on the, especially the refundable credits work out like a child tax credit, earned income credit, and so on can hurt mer- going, getting married on the low income side. I, but, but this is one area on the upper income side, because you would think that higher income individuals would have multiple properties. Getting married could actually reduce the amount of losses that you can, you can take if the two married, you know, you would think it would go up to 50,000, right? So, so 12,500 for married individuals who file separate returns for the tax year and lived apart from their spouse at all times during the tax year. Remember to be careful of married filing separate situation 25,000 for a qualifying uh, estate a state reduced by the special allowance for which the surviving spouse qualifies so if your magi modified adjusted gross income is 100,000 or less 50,000 or less if married filing separately you can deduct your loss up to the amount specified above so somewhat of a low threshold given the fact of inflation, right? That used to be a, a much higher kind of number, 100,000. But if you're talking like a married couple now, 
uh, that might not be the highest of thresholds, right? So if your modified adjusted gross income is more than 100,000, more than 50,000 if married filing separate, your special allowance is limited to 50% of the difference between 150,000, 75,000 if married filing joint, and your modified adjusted gross income. Generally, if your modified adjusted gross income is 150,000 or more, 75,000 or more, if you are married filing separate, there is no special allowance. So that 25,000 benefit, the middle ground, uh, is phased out at an income level, which used to be thought of as pretty high, but given inflation and whatnot is getting to be a realm that more like middle class people are probably going to run into, especially if they're owning, you know, second property. So obviously got to keep that in mind with your planning. So modified adjusted gross income, MAGI, uh, this is your adjusted gross income from form 1040, 1040 SR, 1040 NR line 11 figured without taking into account. So you think of it as basically your your above the line income or your adjusted gross income and then it's modified for these things so the taxable amount of social security or or equivalent tier one railroad retirement benefits the deductible contribution to traditional individual retirement accounts iras and section 105 c 18 pension plans that could be significant on the adjusted the exclusion from income uh, of interest from the Series EEI U.S. saving bonds used to pay higher educational expenses. The exclusion of amounts received under Employer's Adoption Assistance Program. Any passive activity income or loss included on Form 8582. So any real estate uh, loss allowed to real estate perf Continuing on here, it, I don't have my, it's not flying in here. My, someone, what happened to my animation? Que paso? Anyways, we'll just read them off this way. Any real estate loss allowed to real estate professionals, uh, any overall loss from a publicly traded partnership, see public traded partnership PTPs in the instructions for form 8582, deduction allowed for one half of self-employment tax, the deduction allowed for interest paid on student loans, the deduction allowed for, for, for foreign derived intangible income and global intangible low tax income.